Hi, I'm Dr. Jacqueline French. Uh, I'm a professor of neurology in the epilepsy group at NYU Langone Hospital. Uh, I am also the chief medical and innovation officer of the Epilepsy Foundation. And I'm here today to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about taking care of people with epilepsy during the COVID pandemic. And you can actually find more information about this uh, from a neurology article that just actually went online today, uh, which really covers some of the same points, but I am gonna expand on that a little bit. So the first question that is frequently asked is, is there a higher risk for people with epilepsy to get COVID-19? And if so, will they be sicker from it? So there are actually a couple of reasons why we have to worry about people with epilepsy in terms of their risk. Uh, people with epilepsy, obviously their seizures can be uh, take many different forms and everybody is sort of a case unto themselves. But there are people who have focal impaired awareness seizures, that would probably the, be the one of most concern, who uh, would have altered awareness during their seizure and might not be aware of where their hands are and also might not be able to maintain social distancing when they were in the middle of a seizure. This would be more of a concern, obviously, the more frequent that seizures occur. Um, you can imagine someone who has uh, automatisms that uh, often involve grabbing at things in one's environment, that that might not be a great thing right now um, in regards to uh, that you might uh, come in contact with uh, some sort of surface that has virus on it and you might not be aware that you've done that. Uh, probably even more concerning would be people who uh, have some sort of movement, walking or running while confused, either during the seizure itself or in the post-ictal state. What we suggest for those people is that you discuss with them the seizure characteristics that they particularly have and uh, decide between yourself and themselves as the healthcare provider as to whether they are in fact safe to go outside on their own, whether they would need a companion to go outside, or whether they really should be staying inside at this point. Another thing that we are really uh, discussing amongst ourselves at the moment uh, is uh, the issue of masking in regards to people with epilepsy. There is no evidence to support or refute that a mask in somebody who was having a seizure would uh, block the airway uh, or uh, cause a problem, but it is something that should be taken into account on a case-by-case -case basis um, uh, and should be discussed between you and the patient in regards to the safety of wearing a mask and what type of mask, you know, should you avoid masks that have lots of tie strings that uh, could be around the neck and, and cause a hazard, for example. Um, and if, you know, they need to wear a mask, uh, you know, in a work setting, for example, or something else, that certainly uh, may be an issue that you want to discuss with them. Now, the next question that comes along with that is uh, what about the risk to people who have developed COVID-19, uh, who have epilepsy as a comorbid condition, uh, would you expect that they have a higher risk of uh, getting severe disease, of being hospitalized, of being intubated? Uh, we don't have a lot of data on this. Uh, we do have experience. We have experience that we um, have discussed amongst ourselves. So the uh, neurology article that uh, I alluded to earlier was a compilation consensus article that was created with people on an international basis. And that included uh, uh, epileptologists from China and from Italy that had a little bit of a head start on us. Uh, as well as from India, from South Africa, from Australia, and the United States, and also from Europe. And uh, the consensus of all of these people was, and particularly uh, perhaps important in this regard, is the consensus of people from China, uh, that they were not seeing uh, that their patient population that they took care of were ending up in the hospital with severe COVID at a higher rate than they would have expected uh, from the population as a whole. 
Early on, the CDC uh, included epilepsy in the chronic conditions that uh, people would uh, be concerned about. Uh, in terms of severe COVID, but uh, that has not really borne out as far as the data that we currently have. Um, there is another issue of whether um, having COVID-19 increases your risk of having a seizure. And in that regard, as far as all the data that's out at the present time, it appears that um, there there is not a, a risk of an early seizure. You know, uh, people presenting with newly diagnosed seizures, it's unlikely that COVID-19 is underlying that new presentation. However, as they get sicker, uh, as there's more neuroinflammation, um, as uh, they have uh, oxygenation issues to their brain, then seizures can occur as well as confusional episodes that could be uh, confused for seizures, for, for sure. Um, the patients that are presenting to the emergency room at this time who have already have a diagnosis of epilepsy, it is not uncommon that those people presenting to the emergency room actually are not presenting with seizure exacerbation and COVID. They're actually presenting because their seizures are exacerbated in the absence of COVID. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a minute in regards to what the uh, concerns are for keeping people who don't have COVID safe in the era of COVID. But let's just go on a little bit to talk about um, the issue of uh, epilepsy and, and COVID itself. Uh, the data uh, right now supports that uh, in the majority of cases, the virus actually does not reach the brain or the spinal fluid, and therefore uh, we're not expecting a viral encephalitis with seizures, and that's obviously a good thing. Um, there are people who are very, very sick and intubated with COVID who seem, uh, some, some have been seen with myoclonic jerks. Um, sometimes that's an anoxic myoclonia. Um, unfortunately. Uh, another thing that has to be considered is that some hospitals now have had to be creative because they are in short supply of IV midazolam or propofol, which you would normally use to intubate people. And they may be using uh, uh, other uh, types of uh, medications. I've, I've heard narcotic medications and other medications. So you should check and see what the person was intubated with and whether that could be uh, posing a seizure risk or a myoclonus risk. So that's another thing to consider. Uh, I do want to uh, tell you that uh, there are many groups right now that are focusing on the care of epilepsy patients in the COVID era. And there is a lot of information available to you online that you should avail yourself of. And that um, runs the gamut from a lot of questions that people have about when people should be doing uh, neurophysiological tests, how to keep an EEG staff safe, uh, how to uh, uh, deal with an EEG staff that is seeing patients in the hospital. Um, all, of, all of those things have been considered. Uh, there, is, there are several you know, uh, places that all of these resources have been gathered together. So one of them is the COVID page of the American Epilepsy Society, which has a lot of this information from the different organizations. Um, also, the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, the NAEC, has uh, a website. The International League Against Epilepsy also has a website, uh, as well as the International Bureau for Epilepsy. So all of those would be um, resources for physicians looking for information. Um, and then there is also a very good resource for patients that you can, you know, sort of point your patients towards because, you know, as we all know, in the era of COVID, uh, when you do a telehealth visit, the first thing that the patient is going to ask you is about the risk of COVID, the risk to them of COVID, what they should do to protect themselves. So it's important to be able to give the person with epilepsy uh, reading material that they can uh, refer to again and again, and that is uh, frequently updated. And uh, fortunately, there is such material, 
and that material you can find at the Epilepsy Foundation website. So that's the, the website of that is just epilepsy.com. It's very easy. And there is a COVID page for that, and it is updated almost every day in regards to any new information uh, in regards to epilepsy uh, and the, the patient perspective. So I'm now going to actually uh, turn shift gears and talk a little bit about uh, how to keep the patient safe uh, in the COVID era. And of course, keeping the patient safe in the COVID era, era is mostly about preventing breakthrough seizures. And even if a breakthrough seizure happens, preventing that break, breakthrough seizure from ending up in an emergency room visit or even worse in a hospital visit. Of course, hospitals and emergency rooms around the country at this point in time are in different states. They have different capabilities, but in the worst case scenario, such as in a place like New York City, uh, that is the last place you would wanna be. Uh, it would be a very long time before you could get care uh, for a seizure as opposed to all the people who are uh, having very, very serious problems with COVID. And of course, there would be a risk of sitting in an emergency room or being brought to an emergency room. Uh, uh, and on top of that, you can add the fact that the individual with epilepsy might very likely be separated from their loved ones uh, because many hospitals have a, a single patient policy in the emergency room where the loved one cannot uh, attend with the, with the person with epilepsy. And of course, it, uh, particularly in the case of people with developmental delay, for example, uh, having a caregiver is uh, very important. So for all of those reasons, uh, to, to first of all, to make sure we take care of the people with epilepsy and keep them as safe as possible, and secondly, to make sure that our healthcare system is not overburdened, we want to, as far as we possibly can, keep people at home taking care of their seizures. So what are the issues that we have to face in order to do that successfully? Well, the first is that we have to recognize that people with epilepsy who are now sheltered in place uh, have had a significant disruption in their routine. So normally many of them would go to work, now they're not going to work. They may normally be uh, associating very frequently with other members of the family who currently they're cut off from. And there are other reasons why whatever um, plan they had in place to make sure that they take all their medication and are properly adherent may be breaking down. And on top of that, there is sleep issues, there's stress, stress issues. And uh, you know, on, uh, on top of sleep and stress, we certainly don't want to add medication non-adherence as a possible reason why people are having seizures. So uh, I urge you when you talk to your people with epilepsy during a telehealth visit to include a discussion about how are you doing on your adherence, you know, try not to, to, to make it, uh, you know, sort of contentious, but just ask them how they're doing and say, I can imagine you might be having problems and how are you remembering to take your medicine and do you think that you're forgetting any? Uh, there are things that they can do even in the shelter in place, uh, such as uh, just order online a pill box. You know, I am a big, big, uh, fan of the pill box because not only does it remind you to take the medicine, but it also lets you know when you haven't taken it because the pill is still in the box. And as we know, people with epilepsy certainly have memory issues uh, and they may be truly believe that they've taken medication that they have not taken. So um, I highly recommend that if they're not using a pill box that they start to use it in order to make sure that their adherence is as good as it can be. The second issue is um, obtaining medication. And there has been a lot of debate back and forth. You know, should you tell them that they should have a one month supply, a three month supply, um, you know, on hand just to make sure. As of right now, and we are tracking this at the Epilepsy Foundation very carefully, we have not heard of any specific medication shortages that are national shortages. There may be some supply issues in one place or another, 
but we have not heard of national shortages, and that is obviously good news. That could change tomorrow. And uh, we are continually, as I said, tracking it. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, with that in mind, uh, they should at the very least have a one month supply. Um, I think it's not unreasonable to consider a three month supply beyond a three month supply that some people might ask you for is probably going towards hoarding. And we don't want uh, seizure medications to be the new toilet paper, so to speak, and, and other people have access problems because everybody is hoarding medication. So somewhere between a one and three month supply is probably reasonable. But in addition to that, uh, another really important spoke in keeping people at home, not in the hospital, not in the emergency room, is giving them an option of something to do if they should have a breakthrough seizure at home. And this is people who you already know about their epilepsy. They have chronic epilepsy and you know that. And again, as adherent as they are and as good as they're being about everything else, the stress, the lack of sleep and other things might. And, uh, you know, also uh, there, there's a little more alcohol use now in people's houses uh, might produce a breakthrough seizure uh, where somebody had not had one. In fact, in a study that uh, I am doing on newly diagnosed patients, we had a, a patient who had been seizure free on their medication for six years and just had a breakthrough seizure. So that's an example. So even people who seem to be well controlled, it is not unreasonable to consider providing a prescription for a rescue medication. So what do I mean by a rescue medication? Currently, we have lots of different options. Uh, we, we have oral benzodiazepines. They're not gonna work quickly if the person has a tendency to cluster, but if they have a single seizure, they might be able to take an oral medication such as uh, lorazepam, diazepam, and then have time to, for the family to call your office rather than calling the ambulance. Uh, in the case of people who we know have clusters um, or more frequent seizures, then you might want a medication that gets into the body more quickly. For example, um, you might consider uh, a nasal um, diazepam. There was one that was just approved on the market, um, Valtoco. Um, or uh, nasalam, which is a nasal diazepam. There's also buccal medications. So all of those are, are options. And I think that at this point in time, um, giving somebody one or two uh, one or two um, uh, refills or prescriptions of this medication so that they have them on hand at home if they are trustworthy people and uh, uh, you, you can explain to them how to use it, and most of them are pretty simple, uh, is actually right now not an unreasonable thing to do. So a combination of adherence and having availability of a rescue medication. Um, in addition, in, in the article that you know I mentioned, the neurology article, we address the issue of a breakthrough tonic-clonic convulsion. A breakthrough tonic-clonic convulsion in somebody who's had tonic-clonic convulsions before might have precipitated an emergency room visit under other circumstances, just to be sure. Now it's a question of saying to the individual, Did, is there any evidence that there was an injury? Um, did you fall and strike your head? Or did somebody who's with you can check that? Um, if there's no reason to believe that there was any kind of injury and the person is now waking up from a tonic-clonic convulsion, then there is no urgent need to send that person to the emergency room. Again, if they have a rescue medication, they can take a dose of the rescue medication, they can call the office, they can discuss it urgently with a physician that's available in the office. And that would be, in this particular time, probably um, a better option than sending them off to the emergency room. So these are the types of things that you probably should be discussing uh, when you have your next visit, virtual visit with your patient, um, so that you make sure that all bases are covered and you can tell them for other questions that they might have that they can check epilepsy.com. Um, and, uh, you know, that is what we believe is the best way to keep people safe. And with that, I'm going to stop at the moment and ask if there are any questions that people have.